absolute joy to be present this morning uh, at Clark Atlanta University, and I'm grateful that you all are here and you received traveling mercies for the outburst of applause from the sky, also known as a rainstorm. Um, and it is just a wonderful, uh, it's been a wonderful Black History Month. This has been the blackest Black History Month in I don't know how long between the Super Bowl and the White House and the Grammys. It's, it's such a, it, this is a, the blackest Black History Month, we have 29 days. That's how it is. Um, so here at Clark Atlanta University, this Afrofuturism panel is actually an extension of um, black arts movement discussions that we've been having for the past year. And uh, we are co-sponsoring with, uh, with the Office of the Dean, who I will ask uh, Dean Taylor to bring welcome in just a few minutes, but also with ASALH, the Association for the Study of African American Life and History. And what's wonderful about this particular panel and this discussion we're having today is that the life and the history, the culture and the history, are intimately intertwined in this concept of Afrofuturism. My name is Dr. Stephanie Evans, and I'm chair of African American Studies. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Yay! Um, and my research interest is black women's intellectual history, or black women writers. And in particular, I'm interested in life stories and life narratives. And so uh, I've collected a set of narratives called the Sichetta Database, where there's 500 memoirs and autobiographies of black women from around the world, from uh, Australia, from all over the African continent, and um, at a, an interesting point in my life in 2013, I decided to try and write my own memoir, my own short memoir, um, and a short autobiography. And then it turned into um, a then-write narrative. And a then-write narrative is you start telling a story, and then what happened there, right? It, it just took a drastically left and right and crazy turn and turned out to be Chronicles of the Equator Woman. I started to tell my life story and then these other stories started to blend into my life. And so this is the story of Axis Hart, who was born in Ethiopia and through an incident was reborn six, to have six lives, reborn every 700 years on a different continent, always as a black woman. So the equator, relating the equator to color, then I started in Ethiopia, went to Brazil, India, uh, and here we, in uh, Australia, the Aboriginal, and here that's me in 1969, and then in the future in Kepler Prime. And so, see what had happened was, the story just came out that way and it was a blessing. Now this did not concern or worry me at all because my birthday is June 22nd. Come on, okay. And I share that birthday with four, with three incredible women. My grandmother, Mary Edmonds. My eighth grade dance teacher, Pam Copley. Catherine Dunham. And Octavia Butler. So to me, this was a confirmation that it is okay to be strange. That used to be one of my favorite songs in the 80s from Cambia, by the way. She's strange and I like it. And so this is a celebration of the ways that we can understand the complexities of black life stories uh, in a way very much in line with one of my other sheroes, Dr. Anna Julia Cooper talked about this concept of regeneration. Regeneration is retrospection, introspection, and prospection. We look to the past, we look inside, and we look to the future. So it is in very much in line with Dr. Cooper's thinking to understand the concept of black history in terms of 
the relationship to black futures. So um, recently, um, and, and I'll end with this, recently a notebook of Octavia Butler's was discovered. And she was such an incredible science fiction writer and you know really my primary engagement with her was through Kindred. Um, and I, I'm not an Afrofuturist formal, so I'm so looking forward to learning what we have from our presenters today. Um, but Octavia Butler's notebook um, reflected a, con a, a deep understanding of self-determination and self-definition. And in the back page of her notebook, she wrote, I shall be a best-selling writer. After Imigo, each of my books will be on the bestseller list of LAT, NYT, PW, uh, WP, etc. My novels will go onto the above lists, and this is underlined, whether publishers push them hard or not, whether I'm paid a high advance or not, whether I win another war or not. This is my life. I write best-selling novels. My novels go into the bestseller list on or shortly after publication. My novels on the short list, uh, my, my novels each travel up to the top of the bestseller list and they reach to the top and they stay on top for months, at least two. Each of my novels does this. So be it, see to it. And after that, she talks about what she will do. I will send four black youngsters to Clarion and other writers' workshops. I will help poor black youngsters broaden their horizons. I will help poor black youngsters go to college. And that list goes on and on. So Octavia Butler is a wonderful, um, a wonderful way to start this program, this concept of Afrofuturism, and connecting the history of black storytelling in complex ways to an understanding of what it means, the radical idea that black people will write ourselves into the future. Because she says, when I began writing science fiction, when I began reading, heck, I wasn't in any of the stuff that I read. The only black people you found were occasional characters or characters who were feeble-witted. That they so feeble-witted they couldn't manage anything anyway. I wrote myself in since I'm me and I'm here and I'm writing. So this is a wonderful discussion that we'll have all day today from 10 until uh, 12 noon. We'll have a book signing upstairs at 12 noon, and then we'll have the second panel at 2 o'clock, and we hope you join us for as long as your schedule permits today. Um, before we introduce the panelists, I am grateful to have the support of Dean Danelle Taylor, um, and she will bring welcome on behalf of the School of Arts and Sciences. Uh, I bring greetings on behalf of not only the School of Arts and Sciences, but our president, Ronald Johnson, and the provost, interim provost, Dr. Betty Clark. We must always, they're always supportive of whatever intellectual activities that we endeavor to engage in. And this is a real pleasure for me, and I actually, I think Dr. Evans threw me a little loop. I thought she was going to pull the boys out on me, because she always does link everything that happens to Du Bois, and um, I was, rather than doing just the two second, because I can talk very briefly, but I said I'll extend myself a little bit this morning, in understanding the mind and the power of the arts to delve into not just the material present or past, but how black intellectuals have always pushed it forward. So you had Martin Delaney and Blakes and the Huts in the 1850s and 60s imagining the revolution of black peoples. Du Bois, who we all recognize as being the founder of the fields of sociology and being a profound historian, had, to, had, a, had a, not just profound, I don't want to repeat 
myself in that sense. But understanding that how the expressive arts gave insight into the African American experience that he had to include alongside of his more and his drier academic writings. And that he also engaged the world of fiction. And if you're looking at, and I'm I'm not sure what one of our panelists will talk about his scientific his sci-fi short story, The Comet, that he wrote in 1920. Um, and I think we should pay a little bit of attention to popular cultures now and its apocalyptic narratives that the future is all death and doom versus an imagining a place in the future of life. And from all the zombie movies, it just doesn't look like there is any place in the future. But black speculative arts do imagine a space of life. And so I'm looking forward to hearing from our speakers today. And welcome and enjoy.
Her films include Love Shorts, which she wrote and produced, and she also The Engagement, which she directed. Ms. Womack has given presentations about Afrofuturism near and far from Chicago to Louisiana to Canada and Berlin, Germany. Ms. Womack is a graduate of this illustrious institution, the Electric Clark Lane University, and studied media management at Columbia College in Chicago. She resides in the city. We have a distinct honor of welcoming you to Clark Atlanta, welcoming you back home to welcome back. <laughs> Our very own black Anthony and Tasha Bowman. Practice of writing and how his craft developed across the decades. 
It's clear that fiction writing was a major part of his daily writing practice as well as a way for him to test out his more highbrow, philosophical, and intellectual interests in more popular forms. So unlike the comet, The Prince of Steel was never published in Du Bois's lifetime. And here um, is the, the typescript um, from the Du Bois papers. And you can see that in the great stay on W.E.B. Du Bois, Atlanta University, Atlanta, Georgia. So this story remains in and as a typescript with handwritten revisions throughout sitting in the archives. So we became particularly interested in how the Princess Steele signals Du Bois not only as an avid writer of genre fiction, which he was, but these stories really show that he was also an enthusiastic reader of genre fiction. So we really became interested in Du Bois as a reader of sci-fi, fantasy, mystery, detective, So this is the Du Bois who must have been reading pulp fiction, must have been reading popular romance, and must have been reading publications like Weird Tales and its predecessors. Like his contemporary, Colleen Hopkins, his short fiction also really asked to be placed within the fantastical types, tropes, and narratives of turn-of-the-century weird fiction. So of course, we all here know of Du Bois as philosopher, as trenchant social critic, as activist, as writer, as a sociologist, and so on. But I've come to start thinking of this Du Bois as Du Bois the fanboy. <laughs> I'm not sure what Du Bois would think about that. That's really what you see in the stories, right? This kind of Du Bois as fan. So my colleague and chair in Afro-American Studies at UMass, Dr. John Bracey, recently joked with me that Du Bois might not be thrilled to know that we had uncovered this dirty little secret about him. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if that's true. I hope that's not true. But it certainly is the case that the Princess Steel gives us a glimpse of a less serious and maybe a little bit of a less stuffy Du Bois. So this is Du Bois as a consumer of popular fiction, as a passionate writer in his leisure time, and as a prophet of what we now like to call Afrofuturism. So today I don't have enough time to give you an in-depth analysis of the Princess Steel, but let me give you a few plot details that I hope will pique your interest in reading the story for yourself. So this tale opens with a young white couple honeymooning in New York. A man and woman who, we learn, both trained as sociologists at the University of Chicago. The two have seen a notice in the Evening Post advertising a sociological experiment that will be unveiled on the top of a New York skyscraper. Apparently, this sounds to them like a fun activity for a honeymoon. I'm not exactly sure why. Um, but in any event, the couple, we learn, sails up to the top of this building in order to view this experiment. The per first person that they see on top of the skyscraper is an elderly black man whom they disparagingly call uncle. He responds to them by introducing himself as Professor Hannibal Johnson, the sociologist who will be running this experiment. So just from my description here, you may have already recognized the black sociologist in the story as a possible figure for Du Bois himself, who, as Alden Morris has recently shown us, was maligned, dismissed, and excluded by the powerful Chicago School of sociology, just as Dr. Johnson is dismissed in the story by the two white Chicago-trained sociologists. So, so Du Bois' sort of exclusion um, uh, from the Chicago school and his sort of the dismissal of a broader Atlanta school of sociologists is actually on display in the short story in a really fascinating way. And I didn't realize that until I read um, Morris's book. And I think that's another really interesting way to, to read this story to me. So the frame story of the Princess Steel is very much a work of science fiction. So there's this kind of science fiction frame. It features an impressive scientific technology called a megascope, which I think we're going to be seeing and hearing a little bit more about a prototype of a megascope um, from John Jennings this afternoon, which I'm very much looking forward to. So the megascope, it's not exactly clear what it is or what it looks like, but it appears to be this large device with handles, earbuds, a mouthpiece, and some kind of binoculars 
that allow the user to view what Dr. Johnson refers to as the great mirror. So Johnson hooks the couple up to the megascope, and this is where the story shifts dramatically from science fiction to straight up fantasy fiction. So there's this interesting generic shift. So from the skyline of New York, the couple suddenly is able to see what, we, what Du Bois refers to as the terrifying pit of Pittsburgh <laughs> and its hellish scenes of industrial steel production. The Great Mirror ends up being an account of the rise of the modern steelmaking industry offered through a medieval allegory about two knights who battle over the body of an African princess named the Princess Steel. At first, the two knights and as all good allegories go, there's one good knight and one evil knight, right? The good guy and the bad guy. So at first, these two knights battle for the love of the African princess. But the bad knight soon realizes that the value of the princess resides not in her love, but in her hair, which is made of steel. So he, the bad guy, defeats the good guy. He captures the princess steel. And in this really fantastical part of the story, he proceeds to spin her hair onto huge spools that create a, quote, mighty loom of steel across an industrial and industrializing world. We are then given an image of a captive princess steel, tethered and confined to the spools that stretch the iron strands of her hair. So ultimately, the Princess Steel uses, can I give you one more kind of visual? She's, she's, Du Bois loves to give these like luxurious, over the top description of the women in his fiction, right? Sometimes it's really amazing, and other times it's a bit problematic in terms of the gender politics, but there's a lavish, lush description of the bluish radiance of her skin and the glowing kind of strands of her hair. So that's very much a part of this story as well, something we also see in, in um, Du Bois' The Dark Princess. So ultimately, the Princess Steel uses fantasy fiction and Arthurian romance to make visible the central role that African resources and African people, especially women, interestingly, played in the rise and development of a global industrial capitalism. But the final image of the Princess Steel is actually one of resistance rather than colonization and captivity, one that threatens this whole world of steel, this, quote, skeleton of the modern world, might come crashing down should the princess steel decide to, quote, shake her curls loose. So Du Bois writes, and this is kind of a, a long quote, but I hope it gives you a sense for his language. One hand flashed up, and with a quick, sharp grasp, she pulled a single curl. I watched where the curl wended its way past Chicago, past Omaha, past the Great Plain and the Sad Mountain and the rough war roaring of lands toward the sea in San Francisco. And suddenly, the, the world wild in San Francisco. The fire burst, the earth trembled, buildings fell, great cries rang round the world. Only the Princess Steel stood silent and grim in the treacherous innocence. I gasped in fear, again flashed that blue and fatal hand Another curl trembled, the earth sighed and sank and staggered, and the steel stood cold and grim. Again, and the isles of the seas quivered, a great ship shivered and dove to its death. So at the very end of the story, for the first time, we finally hear the Princess Steel's own voice, and her message is a revolutionary and menacing one. She says, I watch and ward above my sleeping lord, till he awake, and then woe world, when I shake my curls loose. Oh, oh, I'm not done with that. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but we should apply for a few voices. Yeah. It's always so over the top, right, and dramatic. It's really, really great. Okay, so, um, okay. So this, as you notice, this idea of her shaking her curls loose, is it, this is it, a, a black woman taking down the global system of steel making and capital. I just want to point that out. It's a really kind of interesting sort of gendered narrative of, of revolution there, right? And that kind of taking down and, and dismantling of this system. So there's much more to say about this fascinating sci-fi, Arthurian romance, black speculative fiction. 
but I'll point you to the UMass Library's online database, Credo, which provides free access to every single item in the Du Bois papers at UMass, including the Princess Steel, as well as Du Bois' other short genre writing. So if you're a detective fiction fan, if you like crime fiction, if you like fantasy, if you like sci-fi, um, I would encourage you to look at the Princess Steel and the other stories. Um, so all you have to do is just Google Credo, the Princess Steel, it'll take you directly to, um, to that document and link you to the other stories as well. And then if you'd like to read our critical introduction and also see our edition, if you're thinking about using it for teaching purposes or a reading group or anything like that, you can find my profile on academia.edu and you can download it there. And the, our edition is annotated as well. Okay, so lately, and this is just to kind of wrap up my comments um, for now, I've been thinking about Du Bois' relationship to Afrofuturism, um, specifically the ways in which works like The Princess Steel look forward to this current explosion of critical, popular, and artistic interest in blackness and futurity. But I've also been asking myself, what would Du Bois think of Afrofuturism? So this is speculation on my part, but I have a feeling that Du Bois would have some critiques of Afrofuturism. I'm curious to hear what my co-panelists think about this. Um, I think he would, he would be excited about it, but I think he would have some things to say. So insofar as his career was marked by future-looking activist work, as well as deep investment in utopian fiction, as well as real-world political utopias, I think he would have been intrigued and interested by this thing we call Afrofuturism. But I also have a sense that he might have been a little bit criti critical and maybe even a little cranky about Afrofuturism. So I've been trying to think about Du Bois as maybe crank cranky Afrofuturist. <laughs> this is my, my speculation. And I should say, this is where I have not passed this by my collaborator, Adrian Brown. I'm not sure what she thinks about this. So if you're going to blame anyone for this theory, you can blame me for it. Okay. So I think that Du Bois probably, because he did this across his work in, in writing, he would have warned us against a certain danger of about a presentism, right? And he also would have warned us about visions of the future that are unmoored from the past. So Du Bois cared deeply about history with a capital H, right? He liked, he cared about Hegel, he cared about dialectics, he was very passionate about this. So he was interested in a dialectical understanding of history in which the present is always in a dynamic and changing relationship to the past. So for Du Bois, revolutionary change can only be enacted through a grasping of this dialectical movement of history and a grasping onto the overarching structures and epic narratives of the past to change the present for a more just and equitable future. So in the end, I'm going to leave you with Du Bois as cranky Afrofuturist, or maybe more generously, as a kind of critical Afrofuturist. Mm -hmm. So in my forthcoming book, which I'm happy to say is actually done and will be out with NYU Press, hopefully in the fall or early spring. Um, so in this book, it's called Fugitive Science. I try to carry out this historically inflected Afrofuturism by offering a prehistory of Afrofuturism in the 19th century, looking to how African-American experiments with natural science actually helped to generate the first works of black speculative fiction in the United States. And I was so thrilled to already hear um, the Dean mention um, Mark Delaney's Blake or the Huts of America, which is absolutely at the center of my book. So this move, I hope, also returns us to some of the important roots of Afrofuturism in science and technology studies. And this is very much how Afrofuturism um, originally kind of emerged in the 1990s, was through science and technology studies. So specifically the work that Alondra Nelson and her cohort did to use Afrofuturism as a way into broader questions about race, gender, and technology. So at the very end of The Princess Steel, we learn that the woman sociology that we were, sociologist that we were introduced to at the beginning of the story, we learn that she has actually not been privy to any of the Megascope's vision, nor its narrative, since, in Dr. Johnson's terms, the instrument was apparently not, quote, tuned delicately enough for her. So the male sociologist sees this whole vision, but she has, has not seen or heard any of it, right? So there's many readings and sort of analyses and ways you could take this moment, this final moment in the text. 
But I think here we see that Du Bois, as he was penning The Princess Steel, was very much interested in this question of the social construction of both race and technology. And in this way, we see Du Bois again looking forward to intersectional analyses in Afrofuturist discourse, as well as broader conversations about both race and gender in the STEM fields. Thank you very much. We recognize that the um, CAU course schedule is between uh, 10 and 11, and then 11 uh, and noon, so we understand that people will be coming and going. Afrofuturism. 
tend to look at Afrofuturism as not something that's off in the distant future. It's actually now. The beginnings of this future, we're creating that future right now with the things that we're creating in terms of technology, in terms of music, in terms of media. All right, the term Afrofuturism itself was created by Mark Deary in 1993. Um, it's a literary and cultural aesthetic that combines the elements of science fiction, historical fiction, fantasy, Afrocentrism, uh, magic and realism, and like I said before, it has become inundated with music, art, and clothing as well. Um, I want to just briefly show a couple of, of the new players in Afrofuturism. Uh, I think we have a familiar face here. It's Big Mac, who you're familiar with already. Uh, and Mr. Jeff Carroll, he's a sci fi horror uh, author and movie maker. You have Mr. William Hayashi, he's also the uh, host of my radio show, uh, Genesis Science Fiction Radio. He has a trilogy of books that are about. What happens when the U.S. government finds out that black people have been living on the dark side of the moon before Neil Armstrong? Mm -hmm. And the whole intersection is called the Discovery Series. So definitely drop in on the site and check that out. And also, J.C. Hope, she's a sci-fi writer and also a real astrophysicist. So these are some of the new faces that you're seeing in the Afrocentrism and black science fiction genres. All right, I want to show you some of the things that have direct uh, association with in terms of contributing to this canon of black science fiction and Afrofuturism. First, in 2008, we created um, a social interactive social network for black people and people that like black science fiction from around the world. Uh, we're representing virtually every country on the planet. And it's not just a site, you just go there and look at the site, and okay, that's nice, and then go to something else. It's interactive like Facebook, where you can post pictures, you can post forums, you can look at videos, you can do all the, pretty much all the things that you can do on Facebook, but it's geared specifically for black science fiction to be disseminated. It's basically just a big group of science fiction from around the world. And I told some of my comrades that in this eight years, well, actually, after the first two years, I learned more about black science fiction in those years than I have my entire life. Because I was plugged into this big hive brain of everyone sharing their information, their experiences, their comic books, their art, their uh, anthologies, and their novels. Next, um, let's get past this one. Okay, and like I said, what is Black Science Fiction? So I just kind of told you it's a community focused on black science fiction. It functions as an interactive club for not only consumers but developers of science fiction um, so that we can communicate, support, collaborate, and thrive together. My big thing with this site is that it's a community, it's a real community. It's not like, okay, it's, it's all about this person here, or it's just about uh, information. It's a community where everyone contributes and everyone benefits. Um, our philosophy is basically rooted in the Uzo Saba, the seven principles of unity, self-determination, collective work, work responsibility, cooperative economics, purpose, creativity, and faith. Now, if we're looking into things that are black, Afrocentric, and Afrocentric, I think that we should have a philosophy rooted in that. And this is what's items that have worked for us consistently. And so, over the past eight years, that's what's kept this site alive, this community. I've seen about 20 sites come and go that are similar, but they didn't have the basis in the community of Afrocentrism to support them.
Next, um, in 2009, we wanted to focus on the art aspect so that we can have artwork in our homes and in our businesses and in our schools that represent this Afrocentrism and black science fiction aesthetic. Each one of these pieces of art, I think we've added probably another half dozen, but each one of these were done by individuals on the site. Um, each one of them is pretty much from different cities. Chicago, represented Chicago, New York, Atlanta, uh, and several other, I can't think of every last one, but this, all of the artwork here is by people on our site. We support each other, not just by, hey, I like what you're doing, and keep doing what you're doing, but no, we purchase and buy things from each other as well. Also, in 2010, we published our first anthology. We wanted to actually be producers of science fiction rather than just consumers. And so we put out the call on the site. I think at that time there were about 2,000 people. So we let people know that we're going to do this anthology. And we took the submissions of the top 25 um, individuals and put that into this anthology. And so but that one is just simply Genesis Anthology of Black Science Fiction. And two years later, we came back and did a similar call and came out with our second book. And I believe we'll be starting the third anthology next week. No, I'm sorry, next month. It's two weeks off. Um, next, in 2011, we noticed, we talked about it, and so we don't just want to talk about things. We want to, as they say, don't talk about it, be about it. So, <laughs> so we noticed that the science, black science fiction writers and creators weren't getting acknowledged by uh, media. So we decided that, hey, let's take it over school and create our own media. And so we created our own magazine that features stories, artwork, interviews, and uh, reviews so that you can disseminate that information, not only on the internet, but this is actually a print magazine as well. All right, uh, further in this media uh, experience, in 2012, we decided to have our own, create our own radio show um, to continue to disseminate the black science fiction and Afrofuturism. Um, Jump. And so we have this radio show. We come on every Friday for about two hours. And we do two hours. A lot of times, we, people do radio shows there about 30 minutes or an hour max, but we do two hours so that we can really dig deep and find out not only what this person is doing or how they did it, but who that person is in their process. And they, they, they share their um, experiences with us. And John Jennings has been on the show as well as Natasha. So I'm really um, excited about continuing. So definitely when you get an opportunity, if you want to hear, see, or read science fiction and Afrofuturism, drop in the site. It's not, like I said, it's not just about one person. It's a community effort. So everyone benefits from this. And we want you to know where to find black science fiction, where to find comics, where to find art, things of that nature. I think one of the biggest problems is that people say, oh, we don't have this, we don't have that. We have it, it's just hard to find. And so what we do, we try to put it in one place so that everyone benefits from it. All right, 2014, uh, we started a sister site where we take the top people out of that 5,000, so up to 5,000, and feature them and promote them as a group effort with future fish. something I'm really excited about. In 2015, um, we started our own uh, 3D film entitled Earth Squad. Mm -hmm. And a quick summation of that is basically you take X-Men and mix that with Independence Day, and that's the Earth Squad. <laughs> and we did a, a, a crowdfunding campaign to raise the money to begin that process. And we, we, 
made about 50 percent uh, progress in that effort. Uh, we and like I said, it's, it, all, it's all people from our site working together to create this meeting. Some more things that I'm involved in and members of the site are involved in. We continue to build, we want to build um, a foundation to create our own stuff. It's okay, but I want to make sure that people continue to push for the mainstream and uh, for equality in mainstream, but to also focus on creating our own stuff, our own minds and hands. And so this year we're starting some video games. We're actually preliminary working on about a half dozen video games um, in addition to uh, little action figures. So some exciting things going on in this side. Okay, I think this is one of a statement that I stick to. Uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Isaac. He was the uh, writer for the I Robot series. And you may have seen Will Smith in his I Robot movie. So if you're not familiar with the book, you can probably relate to that movie. But his statement is today's science fiction is tomorrow's science fiction. That's so true. And so I'm just going to click next and show you just a few of the things that bring that home. And this is from one of my favorite shows, Star Trek. Both, I like Star Wars too, but I'm also a Star Trek fan because yeah. it shows a positive view of the future as opposed to this future of destruction and suffering. But anyway, in 1966, you had Captain Kirk with the communicator. And then 19, here we are in 1993, we have the cell phone. These were, each one of these items were just things in a science fiction world that became really, you know, the tablet. Um, or Captain Carr had, he read his uh, daily notes and his books, things of that nature. And then 2010, we have tablets that we can do those exact same things. 1998, they had flat screen. And here we have flat screens with video conferencing starting in around 2000. And likewise, I want one of these myself. <laughs> in 1998, uh, Captain uh, Benjamin Sisko had this communication device that was the whole computer that he just wore on his head. And in 2013, it came out with Google Glass. And like I said, if anybody wants to donate uh, to the car, <laughs> <laughs> next birthday. So, um, in, in closing, why is all of this important? I say this is important because Afrofuturism and black science fiction give us glimpses of the future that could be rather than just accepting what's going on in the current situation. And I want to encourage, encourage all of you, young people and old people, to contribute and do your part Use your skills to make change. Um, one quick, I think um, one of the, is it, someone says never too late. There was a, a guy in his late mid 40s that created these little cartoon comic book characters. Um, now he's in his 90s, but those characters, have, everybody knows those characters. Spider Man, Incredible Boy, X Men. He was 40 something years old when he started those characters. Also, KFC is not Afrofuturism or science fiction, but the creator of KFC, he was a retired. He was retired. He's in his 60s when he created uh, KFC. So, for the older people in the group, I'm not going to count you out. Make change uh, where you are in your communities. And lastly, um, for your thank you for your consideration. And if you would like to have more information about some of the things that I just discussed, these are the web addresses for the main community site, the magazines, the radio show, the movie, and my personal website. Thank you again for your time. For your
Thank you. 